and so on. And so your mom and dad was the head dinner with them in the last So a lot of questions about your husband. <laughs> so, I did not see your mom and dad. Where, where, where were you guys last week? Across the pond. Across the pond? Yes. This pond out here? <laughs> a little bit bigger one. A bigger one? Where'd you go from? I went to London. Yeah. Uh, London and France. Did you go to the Channel? Mm -hmm. yeah. How was that? Uh, I didn't really notice. I fell asleep on the train. Just <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you're safe with that. Let's pray together and do this. Father, we're grateful for the Lord's day. What a beautiful day you've given us. We're thankful to be together with our church family today. Thank you for the good morning of worship. Thank you for the afternoon, and we're grateful now that we can study the Bible together. Thank you for the mind of prophets in the name of the We're grateful for the, the book of Malachi. These prophets to God who, who spoke of having a burden, a burden for you and a burden for your people. We pray that the way that those are meshed together in the word, that we'll make good application of what we do and have accurate understanding of what we think about tonight. We pray you'll be with us in our study and be with all of what our building needs tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> when you read the book of Malachi, one of the things that becomes abundantly clear from the very beginning is that God, God basically says to his people, your mindset is how little can you do for me? How little can you care about? What's the least that you can do? And he asked them in, in the first chapter, he asked them the question, where is my, anybody remember the word that he uses? Honor. Where is my honor? A son honors his father. And he says, where, where is my honor? Let me give you just a little bit of background to the book of Malachi. Malachi is God's messenger to a group of repatriated Jews who live in and around Jerusalem. And they've been back in the, They've been back in their land for almost a century, for almost a almost hundred years. And they've come back from, from where? Where did God send them to try to teach them a better lesson? The Babylon. And so many of the minor prophets have that as a background some way. And so in the book of Malachi, they return from Babylonian captivity. Malachi is a contemporary of another prophet that was extraordinarily important in the repatriation of the Jews in Jerusalem. Who, who would that be? Nehemiah. And so he is a contemporary of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, of course, his importance to what goes on <clears throat> at this particular point in time cannot be overstated. Nehemiah's burden was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And when we studied the book of Nehemiah, we, we pointed out that the condition of the walls of Jerusalem said something not just about the city, but it said something about the way they thought about the God of Jerusalem. That they had allowed it to become in such desperate shape. So the people of Judah have been back from captivity for almost 100 years. And one of the things that you quickly understand in the book of Malachi is that the fires of revival have, have long been exterminated. Now there was great enthusiasm when they returned, right? And so <clears throat> when they first got back, they get busy trying to do what they ought to do, trying to rebuild things, rebuild, you know, rebuild the structure of worship in the temple and everything. But they got so lax about that that when when God commissioned Haggai and uh, Haggai and Zechariah, he he got onto them and he said, anybody remember what he said? He said, "This is despicable what what you have done. You should be ashamed of yourself." Because you have built for yourselves what? What did he say? And you built really nice places for yourself. And my house lies in ruins. And he says, so you're thinking certainly much more about yourself than you are of me. And he says, and, and he asked both, through both of them, he says, how can you dishonor me? And when he comes to Malachi, that's the word again. <clears throat> you, you're not honoring and so there was another revival, and they began to build, and then they become lax, and then it was just a repetitive cycle that they went through <clears throat> over and over again. So by the time of the book of Malachi, it wasn't that they had stopped practicing their faith. It just was that they had stopped fact practicing their faith with any passion. There was no enthusiasm about it. There was no passion about, about what they were doing at all. In the, in the New Testament, what would, be, what would be the equivalent of that? People that were still going to church, still doing the right things, still worshiping, but the Lord gets on to them because of their lack of passion. 
Where would, where would that be in the New Testament? That was Ephesus. That was Ephesus in Revelation 2. There was a lot of good in Ephesus. We don't sometimes we overlook that. But there was a lot of good there. They had good leadership. You've tried those who say they're apostles and they're not, but you found them to be liars. There were a lot of good things there. But they had lost their passion. So they were doing the right things, they were doing the right motions, but there was no passion <clears throat> there. And the point of it is that they were just going through the motions. That they had lost their focus. And so that's what you have in the book of Malachi. You have a people who are going, they're going to worship there. They're going through the motions, but they've lost their focus. They've lost respect. When you truly respect someone, <clears throat> you give them their your undivided attention, don't you? You don't you don't wander. You you give them when your undivided attention. For example, when, when I asked Vicky's dad if I could marry her, I gave him my absolute undivided attention. There were three reasons for it. Uh, one was that I wanted to show him respect. Uh, another was I wanted his approval. But most importantly, I want him to continue to pay Vicky's student loans. <laughs> and so he had my undivided attention. But Israel's lost their focus, and they've lost their passion. But Malachi is not in a position to order a new building project. New building projects to this day, thousands of years later, focus God's people. And it gives them a lot of enthusiasm. It still does. Just like it was when we built this building. But Malachi is not in a position for a new building project. And so, how's he gonna how's he gonna revive their enthusiasm? How would he do that? Well, the way he does that is by giving his people a face-to-face -face encounter with the Word of God. In the book of Malachi, we've got, you know, it's divided in our Bibles into three chapters. But it's only 55 verses. I want you to think about this. There are only 55 verses in the book of Malachi. But 47 of those verses are God speaking directly to his people. And so this really is a book, before we get 400 years of silence, where God talks, where God does the talk, not the prophet. But God does the talking through the prophet. And when, when the people do speak in this book, what does God do almost every time? Anybody remember? He interrupts them. I mean, over and over, he interrupts, and they'll, they'll say, well, uh, where, where did we ever do and he do that? And he just he interrupts them, and he says, well, here, let me, let me give you an answer to that. Mm -hmm. Don't you hate it when you're talking to somebody, and they anticipate, and they interrupt before you can even say what you want to say? Yeah. But if it's God doing that, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. You're going to listen. And so that's what, that's what he does. Do you have your Bible? Look at Malachi 3. Let me give you kind of the key here. In Malachi 3, beginning in verse 6. Malachi 3, beginning in verse 6. God says, I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, against those who turn away and alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord. Look at this in verse 6. I am the Lord, I do not change. That's important. You need to underscore that in the Bible. I am the Lord and I do not <clears throat> change. And so when God speaks to them, he says, look, you're not going to get a new and improved version of me. You're not going to get Yahweh version 2.0. I am who I am. And so I, I've not gone anywhere. And so when I talk about Malachi, I usually say the theme of the book is this. We can change because God, because God does it. I think that's, when I look at the book, that to me that's the thing. That we can change because God's calling on his people to change. But he makes it clear, you can change because I don't. And so what's important of that when he says, I am the Lord of hosts, I am the Lord, I do not change. If we think about that in the big picture, that would mean that that was true for the people in Malachi's day, but it would also be that it's true for who, for who else? us. And so whatever is in this book, when he talks in chapter 1 about where is my honor, this is what you're doing in worship, this is this is just an abomination to me. In chapter 2 when he talks about priests who weren't teaching as they should. In chapter 3 where he talks about social justice. He, he just says, look, I don't change. And so the point of that is those things matter to God. They matter then and they matter today. And so whatever we read in this book, God goes out of his way to say, look, this, this still matters to me. I like Malachi because <clears throat> it's not for the faint of heart. I mean, Malachi is not, it's not coffee table reading, right? This, this is not 
This is not the Reader's Digest. This, this is pretty tough medicine. Uh, you know sometimes when you get over-the-counter medicine and, it will, and you read on it and it says here's the adult dosage and here's the children's dosage? Malachi only comes in adult dosage. I mean, it's, it's full strength. It is tough material. And so when you get to the, the heart of Malachi again, I want, I want us to be really clear about this. God says, look, I care about this and this and this. You may not, but I do. And that's the lesson he leaves them with for 400 years. The last thing he's going to say is, this is what matters. All right, you have your Bible? We're going to read it a little bit. So let's read, let's read uh, a little bit of the book of Malachi. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you said, in what way have you loved us? And God answers, <clears throat> was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I love, and Esau I hated. I laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. What book did we study that used that identical language to talk about what God was going to do with Esau? Anybody remember? Obadiah. Obadiah. Who said that? Ah, good job, Obadiah. All right. We're not giving away the Mercedes tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Obadiah. Verse 4. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They will be called the territory of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. Now, having that out of the way, this is what he says beginning in verse 6. A son honors his father. The servant is master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am your master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? And God answers this. You offer defiled food on my altar. And you say, well, in what way have we defiled them? And God says, well, by saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind, it's a sacrifice. Is that not evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, is that not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Is he going to be pleased with you? Will he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. Who is there, God speaking again, who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not all kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even though it's going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place incense shall be offered in my name, and pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, said the Lord of hosts. But you profane it, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring the stolen, the lame, the sick, and you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the deceiver, as in his flock a male, and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. Look at verse, the end of verse 14. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. <clears throat> By the way, God says that a lot. Look at chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, my covenant was with him. He feared me and, and, and was reverent before my name. In uh, uh, chapter, what's it, chapter 3, and beginning in verse 5. Chapter 3 and verse 5, where he says, I am the Lord. Or, or they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. And yet I, the Lord, do not, do not change. Chapter 4 and verse 2 talks about those who fear my name. So that, that clearly, that clearly matters to God. Let's talk about three things in the minutes that we have tonight. Number one, God begins by, he says, I want to know where, where's my honor? Where is my honor? Now look at, look at verse 2, chapter 1. Uh, I've loved you. <clears throat> I've loved you, says the Lord. But you say, well, in what way have you loved us? And he talks about Esau, and he talks about Jacob. So Jacob is a twin. His brother is Esau. Anybody remember what the word Jacob means, his name means? It means grasper, heel catcher. And it, it talks about what happened, doesn't it, at birth. But that's the way it was. And that was, that was just a preview of some of the machinations that were going to go on. And eventually God accepts Jacob. And we talked about that when we saved Obadiah, right? So he ends up accepting 
Jacob. And we said when we say to Obadiah, by all rights, it should have been Abraham, Isaac, and who? Esau. Should have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But of course, it's Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. And so, what God says to them is, and this is critically important, I chose you. So he says, I love you. And they say, well, what, what have you ever done to show us that you love us? And in essence, God says, I, I chose you. I chose you. So what's the circumstance that we're familiar with when a parent chooses a child? What, what do we call that? We call that adoption. And God calls it adoption as well, doesn't he, Romans chapter 8. And so God says, look, I, I chose you, just like a parent adopts a child. I chose, I chose to love you. When I was born, my mom and dad, they had no choice. They were stuck with me. You know, whether they wanted me or not, I was theirs. But with adoption, you know, you you have a choice. And adoption requires something. I've got I've got some great friends down in the state of Texas living in Dallas. And they've adopted three children from South Korea. They did it through two time periods. They adopted a, a, a little boy first, and then they went back and they got they got two siblings. And so they went through this process twice. Well, you know, to 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 do that, to adopt, costs them tremendously. As you might well imagine. First of all, it cost a ton of money. A ton of money. Not just for the adoption itself, but traveling to South Korea twice, having to live there for 30 days, having to go through all the legal process there. It cost them a lot of time. It cost them tremendous effort. It cost them tremendous effort. But I will tell you what those three kids will always know as they go. They will know that that mom and dad loved them. Totally, totally loved them and were willing to sacrifice for them. Just like people in this room yeah, for the children that they've adopted in the spirit of God. And so children know that. And Israel should have known that. Israel should have known. The question that they ask is bizarre. What have you ever done to show us that you love us? The very fact that they were back in their land when God could have just left them. He could just left them down in captivity and washed his hands up. Because they certainly hadn't done anything to deserve, to deserve his mercy. But isn't that what mercy and grace are all about? It's not the same. And yet he had shown, he had shown his, his love for them in that. He does that for us. I think sometimes we don't think about that. When we were talking about which one of the minor, one of the minor prophets we were talking about, I can't remember which one it was now. Uh, I, I talked about where I was born. Uh, I was born in Oxnard, California which is the northern suburb of Los Angeles. But I remember in one of the classes, I'm trying to remember that once, I talked about what, my, what would my life have been, how different would my life have been if I had been born 213 miles south. Because if I had been born 213 miles south, where would I have been born? In Mexico. And so my life would have been radically different. And God could have just as easily let me have been born there. I wonder sometimes when we think about that, that, that maybe God put us in the circumstance where he put us because he needed us to do what we can do in his kingdom where we are. I wonder sometimes if we, if we think about God's hand as much as we should in those kinds of circumstances. But God says to Israel, look, I, I chose you. I adopted you. That, that's how you know that I, that I love you. But here's the, <clears throat> the major premise. Oh, oh here's Romans 8 and 15. This New Testament concept, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again. Fear, the spirit of bondage would be that you are a what? What are word for that? Slave. He said, you, God didn't make you slaves. You received the spirit of adoption so that you can cry out, a bomb, bomb. And so that's what God uh, did for, for us. The, uh, the thing that undergirds all of this first section where we're going to talk about what God's talking about is honor is that he says, I'm a great king. I am a great king, chapter 1 and verse 14. The challenge, of course, was that they were not <clears throat> they were not treating him like he was a great king. And so God, you can just tell, God is mentally frustrated that they're, let's use our language here, they're going to church, they're singing the songs, they're praying the prayers, but they're not giving him the honor that he deserves. Look at this passage out of Psalm 96. <clears throat> Give to the Lord, O families of, of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Come to his courts. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him 
all the earth. That is exactly what the people in Malachi were not doing. And yet that's clearly, clearly what God, what God wants. The amazing thing is that when you read the book of Malachi, they don't even realize that this is what they've done. They don't, they don't, and when they are challenged, when they're challenged about that, on two occasions in chapter one, they say, what, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean that, we, that we're not honoring you, giving, giving you the respect you deserve? And I tell you, the point of this is that God is deeply affected by the way we honor or do not honor. Anybody know what the word honor, what that, what the root of that word means, what it has to do with honor? Does that mean? Honor is a word, the etymology of the word has to do with heaviness. Heaviness. And so <clears throat> when you when you say about somebody, look, they carry a lot of weight with me. They carry a lot of weight with me. What you're saying is, I have a lot of respect for them. I have a lot of honor for them. But the people to whom God is speaking in Malachi writes, they're not, they're not letting God carry a lot of weight. How would we say that? They're taking God, what, what would our word be? For granted. For granted? Lightly. Lightly, yeah. It was the opposite. They're taking God lightly. And that's what, that's what he talks about in chapter 1. <clears throat> they're taking him lightly. Israel didn't realize what they were doing. They denied they were doing that. And so God, you know, God says, let me, let me tell you how you're taking me lightly. Let me, get, let me just tell you how you're doing that. And that was the second thing. He said, let's talk about what you're sacrificing, what you're offering to me. Look at chapter 1, beginning in verse, in verse 6. A son honors his father, a servant his master. If I'm your father, where's my honor? If I'm your master, where's my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. Look at this. To you priests who despise my name. And they say, well, in what way have we despise your name? And he said, you offer defiled food on my altar. And, and you say, in what way have we defiled me? And God says, well, because you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. When you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer the lame and the sick, is that not evil? Offer it to your governor. Will he be pleased with you? Will he accept that favorably from you? Says the Lord of hosts. It's interesting, the sacrifice. You know, throughout the book, God says things like this. I am the Lord God Almighty. I am Yahweh Sabaoth. I am the Lord of hosts. And so throughout the book, God uses these kinds of descriptors of himself. And yet he says, instead of, instead of offering me what you should, understanding that I'm the Lord God Almighty, you, you give me things that are defiled. Now here's the question that begs. Why should a first-rate God accept a second-rate sacrifice? That's what he's saying to. Why should a first-rate God accept a second-rate sacrifice? But that's certainly what they were offering him. <clears throat> they were offering him a second-rate sacrifice. When he says offer it to your governor, what, what does that mean? Offer it to your governor. If you're offering that to your governor, what would they be trying to do with that? Probably bribe somebody. Maybe bribe somebody. Maybe Pardon me? Pay Maybe pay your taxes. Yeah. What, whatever interaction you're having with the government, we're trying to use this as currency. That's the point. You're trying to use this as currency for something with the government. And he says, just, just tell me if they'll tell me if they will accept that. See how that see how that works for you. Um, imagine if we were to put that into 2022 language. So if we're if you're talking about a superior, I would imagine that none of us would ever come into a meeting with your superior at work and show up 20 minutes late and while he or she is talking with you, just fidget or look at your watch or yawn when they're trying to talk with you. Because that would not turn out well for me. And in essence, what God is saying is you, you don't treat me as well as you would treat your boss. So in the Bible, so he's talking about sacrifice. In the Bible, there's a word that is used so often with sacrifice where God says, here's the sacrifice that I want. And there's a descriptor with it. He wants what kind of sacrifice? Anybody remember? There's a word. First fruits. What's he, what does he mean by that? When he talks about first fruits, we understand that he was the first of the harvest. But really, what's that saying? The best. The best. That he's saying, I, I want the first investment. Don't be giving me leftover. Don't be giving me the scraps. 
don't be given to me after you've done everything else with everything that you have and you feel like, okay, I've I got to give a nod to God and check an item off the list here. He said, don't be doing that. Give me the first fruits. Give me the first fruits. And so, <clears throat> here's the question. Is God more concerned with the condition of the flawed lamb that is offered to him or the flawed condition of the heart that makes the offer? What's the answer to that? It's the heart. The lamb is just a reflection of the heart. What he was really concerned about was the heart. And that's what he talks to them about in the book of Malachi. I mean, he's trying to get to their heart. The lamb was simply, simply a reflection that their heart wasn't right. And so <clears throat> he inspects, and, and this is so important, don't miss this in Malachi 1, 6 through 8, that he inspects the offerer. Is that how you would say that? He, he, he inspects the offerer before he inspects the offering. offering. Thank you. That's hard for me to say. I'm blaming that on COVID, right? So, but but that's the point. That he, he's concerned about the one who's doing the offering, and what the heart is, and what the attitude is, what's what's behind what's behind all of that. And so, you know, there's there's a call for excellence in all of that. I, I want us to I want us to move on because I want us to get to this last point that's so very important. <clears throat> so that's the deal with sacrifice. We're going to come back to that in, in just a minute, Joseph. Let's say I think also in our modern culture, I've been guilty of this. Um, if I'm traveling or just had a long week, choosing to join a service via video instead of going in person to a local congregation or my congregation. Um, and if, I think a lot of what you say, that if a ruler asked me, said, hey, I've got an important meeting, I want to talk to you, I'm not going to be like, hey, instead of a Zoom meeting, like, no, I'm going to go and be that, I'm going to honor you with my presence. Yeah, clearly, if, that's, if that is available to us, it is certainly by far, certainly by far the, the best the best choice. We're going to come back to this business sacrifice because there's another point that we need to make here in just a minute. But I, I want us to get this on the books before we run out of time this morning. <clears throat> he talks about he talks about worship and he talks about the priests. And he's going to talk about a couple of things here. One is this business of offering that we were just talking about with sacrifice. But then he's going to talk about the business of teaching. All right? So I want you to look at what he what he says. We'll read it together in just a minute. Let me give you a little bit of background. The priests were acting as if service in the temple was, what, what do you call it? You say that serving me is what? Contemptible. That the sacrifice is contemptible. What does that mean? God, God should look at the sacrifice and say, this is contemptible, what you're offering me. But they were saying the sacrifice is contemptible. Why would the priest say that? Why would the priest say that? They're tired of doing it. Okay, that was the other thing he talks about. You say this is burdensome. This is wearisome. But why would the priest say that the sacrifice was contemptible? Was it because they received part of that as their income? That's it. Because they received part of the sacrifice, part of their food. And they, they evidently they didn't like it. They didn't want it. But who was responsible for the quality of the sacrifice? They were. They were. So there are two things that are going on here in regard to worship <clears throat> and, and the priest. On the one hand, he says, look, you are saying that this is just a tiresome chore. This is just a burden. It's a wearisome thing to you rather than an awesome privilege. And the other thing is you're complaining about the sacrifice, and they wouldn't say it's contemptible because they didn't like what they were receiving. Here, here's the point about this visit of worship that we read a moment ago. They see God as an obstacle to get around rather than a God to be on. It's a checklist mentality. <clears throat> well, okay, we've, we've got to worship, we've got to sacrifice. We can check those off the list. We'll give him whatever we have. You know, it's all a voluntary service, so it's voluntary service. He's got to be pleased with it, and and we'll just we'll just leave it as that. But in essence, what God says is, look, you don't want to you don't want to give me time. You don't want to give me effort. You don't want to give me energy. You treat me like I'm an afterthought. You've forgotten how I've taken care of you. You want an inheritance, but you do not want to treat me like I am a father. And God says, I'm just I'm not going to have that. I'm not going to have that. Uh, it's as if God is saying, look, I'm, I'm not going to take your minimum, even if your minimum is better than what others offer. I'm not taking your minimum. In the New Testament, the principle is this. To whom much is given, what? Much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. Carrie and I talk about that all the time. Carrie talks about that all the time. That God has so blessed us in our church family. To whom much is given, much is required. That there has to be that there has to be a response of excellence to what we do, giving the best that we think lives, because God has given that to us, and he's given that to us, and he's given that to us here. But the point of all this, and 
when he's, when he's talking about this, is how, how do we feel when we come in the presence of God? In the book of Revelation, chapter 4, chapter 5. In Revelation 4, you've got that throne scene with God. And in chapter 5, you've got, you've got the scene with Jesus, the Lamb, right? And so the people before the throne of God and then in, before the Lamb, when they are in the presence of God or the Lamb in Revelation 4 or 5, what do they do? What do they do? What physical posture do they have? They bow. They bow. They drop down as if they are dead. And it says as, as, if, they, as, if, as if they are dead before God. And, and so all of this, all of this in Malachi, in this business about worship, is really asking the question, how do you feel in the presence of God? There's an interesting balance here. There's an interesting balance here, isn't there, in relationship. So we looked at Romans 8 and verse 15 a minute ago, and it, it uses this phrase. It says, so we are able to say, Abba, Father. So, I mean, you've heard Bible classes. Abba, but how would, how, in Bible classes, sometimes you hear, we could, we could translate that how? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure that's exactly right, but that's what we commonly say, so surely it is. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not quite that informal, honestly. It is, it is not, it is not saying that it's just high dad. It is, it is more than that, but it is not as formal as the word father. And it clearly, there is a distinction between the two words. And so clearly Paul is trying, in fact, to say something. And so it does speak. It does speak to relationship. But there is a balance in it. There is a balance in it. You know, between, between the more informal and God saying, I am the Lord God Almighty. And again, we may miss that. And maybe, maybe that doesn't matter too much anymore than some. But it matters greatly to God. Eleven times in this book, God uses phrases like this. Great is the Lord, I am the Lord of hosts, I am the Lord Almighty. Eleven times, eleven times in 55 verses, God uses phrases like that. I'm a great king, my name is to be feared, and on and on that goes. <clears throat> when you study the book of Micah with Carson, in Micah 6 and 8, Oh my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. It's talking about worship. And he says, what? Do you not understand who I am? And he, he has to ask that over and over and over again. It just, I, I think that's such a convicting verse, Malachi like 6. <clears throat> what have I done to you? How about you? Because I think it, it compels all of us to ask. Do we, ever, do we ever act like serving God, worshiping God is a burden? And it becomes very clear that God can listen to me carefully. It becomes really clear that God would prefer no worship to worship that doesn't come from the heart. So look what he said in verse 10. Is there anybody among you who would shut the door so he would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no place in you, says the Lord of hosts, nowhere I accept an offering from your hands. And it's interesting. They were offered. They were offered. They were given you something. And he says, I don't, I don't want it. I'd rather have nothing. Just close the doors. Let the fire go out the altar. I'd rather have nothing than to have something that doesn't come from your heart. That's a that's a pretty powerful thought, isn't it? We got one other thing to talk about real quickly. Nathan. I think that verse too speaks loudly for um, the need for people to have effective leadership among them, where people are brave enough to stand up for what is right. <clears throat> You stand up to the face of others and say what you are doing for the Lord is not good enough. That, that's a great point. That's a great point. <clears throat> that particularly, particularly in a culture where so many individuals allow their thoughts spiritually to be formed, shaped, codified by social media, leadership has to stand up and say, no, in this place, what we believe and do spiritually is going to be formed and shaped and codified from the Word of God. And that brings us to the final thought. We've just got about five minutes left. I want you to look at chapter 2, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1, because he segues now to talk about the priests and their teaching. He said, and now, O priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessing. In fact, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. 
Look at verse 3. I will rebuke your descendants, and I will spread refuse on your face, the refuse of your solemn feasts. The one will take you away with it. We'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Drop down to verse 7. The lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way that is from God's way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> I like uh, the translation of Mal Malachi 2 8 that says this. You've turned from the way and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You violated the covenant of Levi. By your teaching you have caused many to stumble. So let me ask you this. When, you, when we get to chapter 2, think about the th three things that we talked about this far. So when you get to chapter 2 and he says this, why were the people bringing second-rate offerings to God? And why were the people <clears throat> offering half-hearted worship? Now they were responsible for that. But why were they, why were they bringing them to sacrifice to God and, and offering that kind of worship? It was acceptable. Because the priests were letting them do it. Yeah. You go back to what Nathan said. Because the priests were not stepping up and saying, hey, this is wrong. What you're doing here is wrong. God's not going to accept that. And so they're letting them get away with it. And so God is going to take them to task for them. The priests had watered down the high and holy presence and teaching of God in order, evidently, when you read between the lines here, in order to be more popular with the masses. That's a tremendous temptation, always, you know, to teach only what <clears throat> individuals want to want to hear. I mean, it's almost, when you, when you read the book about, when you read chapter 2, it's almost like the priests had taken a poll about what the people wanted what they wanted to hear, what they wanted to do, and said, fine, you know, we'll, we'll let you do that. Kind of letting them cut and paste with the, with the Word of God. And we rail against that, and we ought to rail against that. I mean, what, what we have to be about is what, what Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and 27, I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And that has to be our mantra. That, just, that absolutely just has to be our mantra. Let me ask you, you think there are any sins that we tend to ignore? Absolutely there are. Yeah. We don't ever talk about that. I'm not even sure we ever think about that. But I, I think there probably not. I, I gotta tell you, I, I've been preaching for a long time, over four decades. And I, I have heard people confess amazing things in front of an audience, I will tell you, in four decades. But I, I've never heard a single person ever come forward and confess uh, self-righteousness or gluttony. I've never heard anybody come forward and confess a failure to forgive other people. I've never heard anybody come forward and confess gossip. I've never heard anybody come forward and confess pride. Well, evidently because those things don't, they don't ever happen anymore. No, I think it's sometimes we, we just kind of think those things are written in the invisible ink. And somehow they don't, <clears throat> they don't really, don't really apply to us. So could it be that there are portions of God's word that we believe are just kind of written that way that that's really not, not applicable? We, we're out of time. Let me just put one other thing up here real quick. There's a difference between those two lines. The top line has become very popular in 2022, particularly in what's written in social media among Christians. What do the scriptures say to you? That is not the question. The question is, what do the scriptures say? Period. And so that means that when there is a question to be answered, an issue to be decided, a matter to be resolved, the issue is not, what does my favorite preacher say about it? Or what does a school of thought say about it? Or what does a, what does a school say about it? Well, what does my family say? The issue is, what does God's word say? And that's what they've gotten away from in Malachi chapter 2. So, for Wednesday night, I'd like you to read chapters 3 and 4. All right, and we'll pick up right there. Thanks for your help tonight very much.